this is Richard Daigle with the Landscape Certified Contractors Association at the City of Santa Ana. We're having our event today on water management and auditing, and uh, we'll be starting soon. Thank you. One hand for You guys ready? ready. Whoever's going to come is going to come. So we'll uh, go ahead and get started. My name's Richard Daigle, and this is the Landscape Certified Contractors Association in part with uh, Irrigator Tech, the Cole Training School, and uh, the City of Santa Ana. So we're gonna uh, have some speakers, and the first one will be uh, Mark Pettitone from ET Water, and uh, then Mark will introduce the next person, and we've got some great people here today. We've got some vendors in the back. We've got ET Water, and then we have Daryl from uh, GPF, and uh, he'll be, uh, showing some product and Javier's in the back from Toro and uh, a lot of other vendors, Daryl's here from uh, Dura. So um, make sure you guys listen and we'll have some great information on uh, some good water, smart things. So uh, I'll introduce you to Mark. Thank you much. Okay, now we don't have this microphone actually is only for the recording. So those guys in the back, if you want to move on up front, there's lots of seats because uh, I'm not going to yell. But uh, so we're basically here today to talk about uh, Smart Controller and Smart Controller Month. That's the reason why we held this off until July. Uh, July is Smart Controller Month and we decided it'd be a good opportunity to talk about Smart Controllers and the rebate program. So today, after my talk, we have Kristen uh, Henninger, who is German, whose team won the event yesterday. Sorry, Mike. And uh, she works for a company called Clear Results and they run the rebate program uh, for the state of California, MWD. So uh, they actually, MWD hires a private company to handle the rebates, the processing uh, of those programs, and she's the gal, so she's here today. She'll tell you about the rebate program, what's available. The rebates just went up again, just in the last week or month or so, on top of the PAL program that went up a couple of months ago. So she'll go through all of that live. And uh, so what I'm gonna do here, so point to Daryl like that, down button. There we go, first put, hit it again. So why are we here today? We're here today, first of all, to talk about the need for water conservation. We want to explain what's going on here in the state of California in regards to water availability and water costs. Uh, we're gonna go over an overview of smart controllers. What is a smart clock? Uh, who is certified, who isn't certified? What makes a controller smart? Uh, I'm going to be a little self-serving here, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit about ET Water, because I can, so we'll do that. And then we're going to talk about the pros and cons of uh, smart technology. You know, it's not the panacea that some people think it is. We'll talk about some, some of the realities in regards to how that works. So first of all, why are we here today in July? Well, because again, July is Irrigation Month, it's Smart Controller Month. This goes back to when the Irrigation Association basically dedicated July as Smart Controller Month. If you're buying from various vendors, you might find uh, various vendors like UN Imperial and so on that will offer special pricing in July for smart controllers because they want to promote July. The reason July is picked is July basically is the peak month for water usage. So they figure it'd be a good time to really make this information public and talk about water conservation and smart controller technology. Uh, yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, yesterday I went online. I just simply uh, selected California drought. I selected uh, over the last seven days. So I wanted to see some recent articles to see what was available out there on the drought in California over the last seven days. And there were many, many, many articles talking about the state of our drought here in California. We have had droughts before, but right now it's getting pretty drastic. Here is one from the uh, uh, Uncovered California uh, blog and talks about nearly 80% of California now is suffering under extreme drought conditions. Next. Here's another uh, website called uh, Bios, and they're also talking about the fact that California is under 80% uh, extreme drought. Look at this picture here of this lake or lack of lake, and it basically looks like a bunch of little tadpoles sitting in what's left of a puddle. So you can see it's getting very uh, very drastic right now. Next. 
<clears throat> this is a picture of the drought by region in California. And I think the way you read this is they talk about abnormally dry, moderately severe, extreme, and exceptionally drought. So the, wor the way it works is that if you go over to current and you go across where it says 100%, that means 100% of the state of California right now is at least in abnormally dry condition. If you move, move over to the right where it says D1 to D4, it says that 100% of the state is at least in moderate drought. You keep going across and 100% of the state is at the level where it's at least severe drought. When you go over to D3, 70, almost 79% of the state is under extreme drought and 36% of the state is under exceptional drought. If you go back a year ago and see what we're, where we were at at this time, we had no percentage of the state either under extreme or exceptional. Pretty much everything was over here at uh, yellow, which is the uh, abnormal and moderate drought. So we were having a very, very dry season, and obviously there's only so much water to go around, and when there's not water for irrigation or water for other things, so we're gonna be the guys that are gonna get hit first because we're looked at as being kind of the wasteful people in, the, in California as the way that we use our water. Next. Here's another article talking about the water fetches record prices in drought hit California. And it's talking about the farmlands and those guys having to pay extreme amount of water or money for water and they're actually selling their water rights off to other people to cash in on it. Next. A couple of articles from water agencies. This is a de desert water agency out in the Palm Springs area. There is two water agencies out there, Coachella Valley Water and Desert Water Agency. They put a uh, tiered water rate structure out there about five years ago, which really hit the market hard in that area because you have a lot of associations where you have retired people that are on fixed incomes. And when the maintenance contractors spend too much water on their landscapes, they get hit with assessments, additional costs for the water. So it's been very expensive over the last five years. Well, again, this article is just a few weeks old, uh, June 18th, in fact, and it's talking about that the water rates are gonna go up 22% starting July 1st. That's a hit, 22%. You know, again, if you're on a fixed income and all of a sudden you're, you're paying, you know, you know, 20 bucks a month for the water to the association, it goes up over 20%, that's, that's gonna nail you pretty good. Plus again, these guys are on a tiered water rate structure. So if you don't do a good job of applying the water, you're gonna cost yourself some additional money. Next slide. Here closer to home, this is, the, this is IRWD, this is Irvine Ranch Water District. And there's basically three different customers that are listed on here. The blue is the, what they call the, uh, the, the uh, what is it? Uh, do, 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 do. Um, Irvine Ranch service area, then the Los Alisos service area, and then the Orange Park area, Acres service area. And they charge the customer by the tiers. So they basically calculate how much water you should be able to put down for the month based on ET. If you stay under a certain amount, you get charged a certain amount per uh, CCF. So as an example, if you look at the blue area there, if you're using from zero to 40% of your allocation, they're only gonna charge you 88 cents per CCF, pretty inexpensive. If you're in the 100% range, they're gonna charge you 1.34, $1.34 per unit of water, not too bad. But if you get into some of the higher rates, if you're wasteful, and if you look at wasteful, it's not four or 500% of your allotment, it's 161, it's not that high up there. If you're at 161% of what they consider to be what you should be using, you're paying $12.60 a unit at that level going up versus 88 cents. You're paying 15 times the unit cost of water when you are extreme. So if you are in an area where you are not watching your water use, you're not using smart technology, you're not adjusting your systems according to the weather, you're gonna be costing yourselves a lot of money. Again, 1260 down in the middle area, and then the, uh, the Orange Park area, Acres area is different. Next slide. So let's talk about what is a smart controller, where this came from. 
So a smart controller is defined as such. Smart controllers estimate or measure depletion of available plant soil moisture in order to operate an irrigation system, replenishing the water as needed while minimizing excess water use. A properly programmed smart controller requires initial site-specific setup and will make irrigation schedule adjustments, including run times and required cycles, throughout the irrigation season without human intervention. And that's the key there is the fact that these controllers can make these adjustments without somebody intervening. It'll automatically do it based on weather, soil moistures, or whatever the case happens to be. So the logo in the upper left there is called WaterSense. And initially when smart controllers came out, it was basically a, a name that was given by the Irrigation Association to, again, controllers that could self-adjust. And it was pretty well mandated and controlled by uh, the people at, at uh, Fresno State CI, CIT, Center of Irrigation Technology. As the years progressed, the government obviously wants to get involved. So they have a program, or they had a program at the time called Energy Star. And I'm sure you all have appliances at home that have Energy Star labels on them. Well, Energy Star is ran by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And the manufacturers, Westinghouse and Sears and Maytag and everybody else, if they want their devices to be approved as being energy efficient, they have to have their equipment tested through these private labs that the EPA runs. And they've had to make modifications to their units to make sure they're, they're more efficient and so on. Once you've gone through the labs, you've paid the, the fees, and you've qualified your products, your products are allowed to carry the Energy Star logo. What good is that? Well, the various electric agencies will offer rebates if your product meets those qualifications. That eliminates the energy companies from having to test stuff. They simply will follow whatever the EPA says is energy efficient. If it carries the Energy Star logo, they approve it, and they'll offer the rebates. So that has now progressed to water devices, and the EPA again got involved and put together a program called WaterSense. So the WaterSense is the water, in, in essence, uh, uh, sister to Energy Star. We as manufacturers, like ourselves, like Toro in the back, we had to go through all these private testing labs, take our products, make modifications to qualify and satisfy the EPA, and then had our products water sense approved. Now once they're water sense approved, then the various rebate programs, as Christian you know, is going to talk about, simply looks at the EPA and water sense approval as basically giving the thumbs up or the thumbs down as to whether your product can qualify for the rebates. So you'll start seeing this water sense logo on lots of products. It's not going to be just controllers. It's going to be in other things that save water, whether it be toilets, or sprinklers or whatever the case happens to be. But that's kind of where we're going now with the water conservation thing and the government getting involved. Look for the WaterSense logo on products. Okay, control systems then and now. Let's talk a little bit about where things used to be and how the market has kind of changed over recent years. We'll take these one step at a time. First of all, in years past, and again, some of us have been in the industry for a long time, you know, Javier and I used to work at Rainbird together back in the good old Maxicom days. And uh, back in the days, you basically had what is called a central computer. So if you're running one of these high-end systems, you would have a computer sitting in the corner of the room that was dedicated to running the system. Today, we don't have that any longer. We have basically any kind of a non-dedicated internet device. So whether it's my laptop sitting over here, or my smartphone, or my iPad, doesn't matter whether I'm sitting at the office, or at Starbucks, or at home, basically I have internet access, I have a central control everywhere. Next. In the old days you had localized software. Every time we made an update, we would have to send you a disc, or a DVD, or a CD, or whatever floppy disk, whatever the case happens to be, and you would have to load that in that central computer sitting in the corner to make sure you were getting all the latest updates and you were up with everybody else. That no longer is required. Now with all the companies like Rainmaster and ET Water and WeatherTrack and so on, where their systems are running online, everything's web-based. So if the manufacturer is updating the system constantly, every customer is on the same platform all the time. 
There is never an issue regarding whether or not you're running the latest version of something. If you're online, you're running the latest version of it. Next. With a centralized computer, it's up to you, the user, to back up all your schedules. When your computer crashes, I will not say if it crashes, when it crashes, you better have backups to your system because if you don't, you're going to lose everything. With everything being on the web these days, the manufacturers are backing that stuff up online so that there is nothing to back up on your own computer. Companies like ourselves, we actually use server farms. We have server farms in three different states. We use the same company that Amazon uses. So in case one building were to burn down or one network were to get crashed, we have additional mirrored backups, twins basically, that are still up and running. So the, the risk is almost you know, non there. Next. In the old days, most of the communication was either through hard phone hookup, uh, radio communication, or even hard wire. Today, a lot of that communication is now going over to uh, cellular. Uh, because why? It's easy, it's simple, there's nothing to set up. Something I recently found out about was the fact that every vending machine that's out there, that's been built in the last 10 years, has a cell card in it. In the old days, if you were working for a vending company, you would bring your rack of products in to replenish the vending machine. You had no idea what you were going to run into. You didn't know whether you needed to bring more Doritos in versus Baby Ruth's or Waters versus Cokes. You just brought everything in, you replenished the machine. Today, those machines are in constant contact to their owners, telling them exactly what needs to be put back in the machine. It tells them when they're out of Doritos. It tells them how much money is in the machine. It tells them the dom domination of the money, how much change is in there, and so on, so that when the, the guy comes out to service the machine, he knows exactly what he needs to bring. No more, no less. So cellular is used in a lot of industries besides just the irrigation industry. Next. In the old days, we would have dedicated computer or dedicated weather stations that you would purchase yourself. Back in the day, that's back when CMOS first came around and they put in, I don't know, 50 plus weather stations in the state of California. Manufacturers would buy their own Campbell Scientific weather station. The owner would be required to buy this $15,000 weather station, put it on site, which sounded really good, except that if they didn't maintain it, they didn't keep it up, the weather station would give you erroneous information and it turned that erroneous ET, evapotranspiration, would give you bad schedules. So as time progressed, people said, there's got to be a better way to do this. So there are weather networks that are out there, many of them, that have these weather stations already installed for other reasons. And they have software in place that is constantly monitoring the weather stations to make sure that they're running 100%. There's software in place that can look at the weather station and determine if it's beginning to falter. They have all sorts of algorithms that are in there that are looking at comparing weather stations side by side. If one weather station begins to falter away from the norm, they will automatically shut that station down and the system will automatically route you to another weather station to make sure you're getting the best ET possible. The story that I tell was back in my Rainbow days, we had just put out MaxiCom and Maxi, and our system looked at our own weather stations. And whatever the weather station said the ET was, is what the system would put down. Well, we had a bird take a dump on a solar radiation sensor on a weather station at a golf course, and it threw off the equation. So instead of getting a number like a quarter of an inch or a third of an inch for ET for that day, the weather station calculation said you need to put down 10 inches. Well, the computer does what it's told, so the computer said, fine, I'll put down 10 inches of irrigation tonight. It put down 10 inches of irrigation on an elevated sand green, that we washed away and cost us about a quarter of a million dollars. So you kind of learn a lesson from that, that there's, again, you got to have safeguards and backups there to make sure that the information you're getting is reliable because the top of the pyramid with these systems is going to be the weather information. Good information, good schedules, lousy information, lousy schedules. Next. Uh, in years past, the flow monitoring, flow sensing was complicated. In many cases, you would actually have to go out there and record the flow by station with a device and then take that information and hand input it into your systems. So it made it very difficult. Every time you wanted to make a modification 
or a change to the system, again, you'd have to go out to the field, note those changes, record those changes, come back to that computer stuck in the corner, and plug it into the system. On today's systems, many of the manufacturers will automatically learn the flow when the system is running. You simply tell the system the brand, the size and type of flow sensor you have, and when it runs, it'll automatically record the flows because it's counting the pulse rates, and it will input that into the system. Anytime you make some sort of a hydraulic change, you talk to Kirsten and she gave you some money for changing your nozzles from pop-up nozzles to uh, MP rotators or high-efficiency nozzles that Toro offers, you're changing the hydraulics of the valve, you would need to go in there and relearn the flow of that particular station or stations. Today it makes it very simple to do that. In the old days, not so much. Uh, firmware upgrades were difficult. Again, I go back to my Rainbird days where we would send out floppy disks, and then the firmware basically is the instructions that's on the chip in every electronic device. <clears throat> so if you have a phone, you have a firmware in there. If you have a TV, there's firmware in there. If you have a recorder, a computer, whatever, a GPS, all those devices have a chip in them that has an instruction set that every once in a while needs to be modified to be able to take new enhancements or to fix bugs. So in the old days, every time we made a change, we would have to send the customer a physical chip on what was called this plastic sled and they would have to go out to their devices and pull the old chip out and drop a new chip in. Well, you can think of all the possible combinations, what chip the guy was running versus what software he was running, and it made it very difficult for the manufacturers to keep everything 100% running. With everything being on the web, the web end is always going to be the same for every customer. And then manufacturers like us, we have the ability to change the firmware over the air. So we no longer have to go to the field plug a laptop into it and update the firmware, our system does it over the air. Again, guaranteeing that every customer is on the same version of firmware to make sure everything's 100% compatible. So about two months ago, we did 5,000 clocks over a four-night period, in, bringing every clock up to the same version of firmware, taking care of a couple of bugs and adding additional features and potential features coming down the road. Next. Uh, the older systems didn't have very much in regards to electrical diagnostics. Typically there were fuses, there were circuit breakers and clocks, there wasn't a lot of monitoring remotely. So you still had to do a lot of running around in the field periodically to test to make sure your systems were running properly. The newer controllers now have the capability to monitor for shorts, monitor for dead shorts, monitor for open circuits. So again, they will give you preemptive information to let you know that you have a valve that's beginning to wear out. You have an open circuit, which means that there may not be a station running because a wire is loose or there's a bad splice in the field. If there's a dead short, it won't take the entire controller down. It'll just take that station down. It'll let you know about it and then go on to the next station. So that way your landscape won't suffer. You don't have to wait until you see dead grass before you go out there and react to the problem. Next. And there were dedicated remotes that people would use on their systems. You would have to buy a dedicated remote, go out to the field, plug it in, go out and run around with it. When you're done, go back to the clock, pull the remote off, go to the next clock. Uh, UCLA had a system like that where they would go out and plug a remote into their controllers. The guy would go around the corner and he'd be working on a valve, repairing it, and he's turning things on and off, and all of a sudden, it's not working anymore. He's going, what's going on? he go around the corner, the remote's gone. Because if it isn't locked down with all the people the pedestrian traffic running around a campus, it just disappears. Now, again, with online web-based systems and cellular access and whatnot, you have the ability to use any kind of a smart device as your field remote. You can hop on your smartphone and turn stations on and off. There's no distance restrictions. You get a verification back. You don't have to make a trip to the controller. You go right to whatever you're working on, turn stations on and off, and go on to the next job. So it's less expensive. It's more efficient, and it's easier to use. Let's talk a little bit about the different segments of the industry and what they're looking for in smart technology. And every customer has different wants and needs and what they're looking for to get out of these various systems. So as an example, if you're a property owner, you're looking for money. I mean, that's what you're really looking for, is you're looking for the water savings, the dollar savings that it's going to give you. That's one of their main concerns. 
Obviously, you want to make sure you're compliant with the water regulations. You don't want to get yourself in trouble. Uh, you want to limit the amount of property damage. You don't want water seeping into buildings. You don't want to be getting uh, uh, black mold and those kind of things. So you want to do a good job of maintaining the, the irrigation of the landscape. And of course, obviously, it's going to enhance the landscape and it's going to make the landscape look good. You keep your rents high, you can, you can rent your properties, you get happy homeowners, and so on. If you're a landscape manager, again, your interest, number one, is labor savings. You may not be paying the water, it's not your water. Your deal is the fact you're trying to conserve the amount of labor on a project and not having to have a guy run around every week or every month or whenever you do it to reprogram the controller, that labor can be utilized elsewhere. You can utilize him to do more sprinkler repairs, checking on the landscaping and so on, so that's a big deal. Again, you're, you like the fact that you can have the remote access remotely without having to plug remotes in. Uh, you want to have the enhanced flow and electrical monitoring to make sure you're not going to have issues on your projects because they're going to come back to you if there is an issue with a blown system or you've had a runoff or you've had a blowout, those kinds of things. And you like the fact that you have reporting tools. You can report your water usage. You can report your problems. You can run out reports and send it to guys to go out and service equipment in the field. Water system operators, basically the water agencies, they like this technology because it can more balance their water load, their load on the entire infrastructure of how much water is being utilized. We've actually had some systems where the city itself has access to all of the smart controllers and in case there is a major fire and they need the water pressure, they have the ability to remotely shut off all the clocks to make sure they're not wasting water watering a park when they need the water over here and the water pressure over here to put out a fire. So again, they have those kinds of uh, uh, uses, again, on demand uh, conservation. If everybody's wasting water, then they can't add more buildings, they can't add more homeowners, there's not enough water to go around. Next. So now I'm going to be a little self-serving, talk a little bit about how our system operates. You can talk to Javier afterwards, he'll explain how their systems work. But the way the ET water systems work is, number one, the user simply gets online to some sort of an online computer. <clears throat> they enter their landscape profile, online and they and that's saved in the cloud. Secondly then the local weather station captures the information, talks to our servers and we get a daily ET number. ET being evapotranspiration. Evaporation and transpiration we're simply trying to replace what has been used up. Uh, four, then the controllers connect wirelessly to the servers on a daily basis and they're updating themselves with the latest schedules based on that ET and based on the profile information the customer has given us. Is the station a lawn? Is it shrubs? Is it spray heads or rotors? Is it in the sun? Is it in the shade? Is it slope? Is it flat? Is it clay? Is it you know, sand? Whatever the case happens to be. That's all the profile, the landscape audit information you plugged in. And then the controllers execute those stations, those uh, schedules on a daily basis. And if there are issues, those issues are reported back. Whether those issues are electrical problems, flow problems, Maybe, enough, maybe not enough water window time because it's the middle of summer and you put too many restrictions on the system and so on. Next. Again, this shows you an example of uh, the system we're using that is called WeatherBug. They have 12,000 weather stations nationwide. So again, this eliminates the user from having to buy and install their own weather stations. We're paying these guys pretty good money to maintain and have access to their weather network. So it makes your job a lot easier. You don't have to worry about whether the weather station is running properly and whether you need to get out there and maintain that. Next. We talked a little bit about ET. It's a complicated slide, but basically what we're all trying to do here with these smart controllers is to basically put back down what we've used up. ET, evapotranspiration. How much water has evaporated from the soil? How much water has transpired from the plant material? And our goal simply is to keep the tank filled. So we'll simply measure <clears throat> how much water is being used mathematically or otherwise. And when the tank gets to a certain point, in many cases that point is 50% of the allowable irrigation is used up, we then fill the tank back up again. It's like you with your car. You know, if you're like Marcy, she always keeps her car topped off. So whenever it gets down to about 50%, she's heading over to the gas station. Sometimes it takes her a couple of days to get to that usage level. Sometimes when she's driving all over the place, she may get there in one day. It's the same thing here. 
in the middle of winter, it might take you days or weeks to get to the point where you used up half of the amount of water required. But in the summertime, you may be watering every day. just depends. Next slide. Uh, we at ET Water have basically three products. Real simple company. We don't make sprinklers. We don't make valves. We sell three things. We sell a line of clocks, which is off to the right. These clocks are modular from eight stations to 48. They have cell cards built into them. They have electrical diagnostics built into them. They have sensor inputs for flow. They have sensor inputs for uh, rain and otherwise. We also make a line of replacement panels. That's the slide in the middle. So unlike the other manufacturers, we recognize there's a huge market in retrofit. Back in our days at Rainbird, we were always looking to try to sell somebody a central because nobody had them. So we were out there trying to hit every city, every school district, trying to get the, them to buy our central. Well, that was wonderful 30 plus years ago, but the issue right now is everybody has them, but they're getting old. And they're antiquated, they don't have the modern technology in them, so now we're going back to those people and we're offering them newer technology that gives them more pluses than what was available before. So because we're a small company, it's easy for us to manufacture a line of replacement panels uh, to go out and replace some of the older systems that are out there. Some of the larger uh, mainstream companies aren't going to do that because, you know, Rainbird's not going to want to develop a panel for a Toro and, and vice versa. So we have the replacement panels. And then the third product we have on the left, and it's in the back of the room, is something we call the Hermit Crab. And the Hermit Crab is an add-on device. So if a customer has fairly new clocks, they don't want to throw their investment away, but they would like to get into smart technology. They would like to be able to monitor flow. We have a device called the Hermit Crab that can attach to about 82 different hosts. So we basically have seven cables, and we can attach to pretty much anything that's been manufactured in the last 10 years. So every 100 clock that they manufacture, the Hermit Crab can adapt to. Pretty much anything Rainbird's made in the last 10 years, we can adapt to. Uh, some Toro controllers, Rainmaster controllers, Eritrol, Superiors, Weathermatics, and so on. We basically just take over the clock. We just plug into it, we mimic a field remote, and the clock is turned off. The clock is in a, in a mode where it's not going to run its own schedules. All the scheduling comes through the Hermit Crab. It's the same scheduling that you would have on your clocks and your panels. You still have access with your smartphone and your tablet, and we basically instruct the clock what to do. That's why we call it a hermit crab. A hermit crab does not have its own shell. It crawls around the bottom of the ocean looking for the right size shell to inhabit. It crawls in it. As it grows, it outgrows the shell. It drops it off and goes finds another one. We kind of do the same thing. We don't take over. We don't irrigate on our own. We simply take over the clock that's out there, and we tell it what to do. By the way, all these products are on the water sense approval list, so they're all available for the rebates. Next. Uh, just, you know, a little again, self-gratifying here, the fact that our, pro our product and software has won all sorts of awards, blah, blah, blah. Next. And again, we can work pretty much on any platform. So again, the beauty of these web-based systems is in the old days, we had very tight specifications as to what you could put your system on. It had to be an IBM PC with so much RAM, with so big of a hard drive, with a certain speed processor. You couldn't put it on compact. You couldn't put it on AT&T. It had to be this specification. Today, being web-based, we don't care. We don't care if you're on a tablet, whether it's an iPad or a Galaxy. We don't care whether you're running on a Mac. We don't care if you're running on a PC. We don't care if it's Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Puffer, whatever the, ha the browser happens to be we can work on any of those devices. Next. And again, then we have also mobile, I hate to say, I don't want to use the word application, but we have mobile websites that are dedicated to mimic remotes. So instead of having to plug in a remote, you can go out in the field and these mobile devices have been designed to be very easy to use, turning stations on and off, going up and down through stations, monitoring the flow on the screen, monitoring electrical usage on the screen. So you can do a lot of troubleshooting without actually going out to the clock itself. Next. This talks a little bit about the Hermit Crab. This shows you some of the hosts on the bottom here that the Hermit Crab can attach to. We have some of the larger manufacturers like us because they get to sell the clock and then we also get to sell the Hermit Crab, so it works out real nice. Some people might replace a really old, expensive central 
and they don't want to spend a ton of money, so what they'll do is they'll buy a less expensive new controller and then put a hermit crab on top of it. So that's another option some customers have. Next. This is the, what we call a landscape checklist. This is basically your landscape audit. The better job you do getting this information, I don't care whose system you're using, the better your system's going to run. It's garbage in, garbage out. If you don't take the time and you don't go out in the field and you don't sit there and look at exactly what is going on with the, your landscape as far as sun exposure, soil type, application rate, precip rates, and so on, the manufacturer can only do so much with it. You know, one of the problems we run into, and I'm sure my competitors run into it too, is a lot of guys over time just replace nozzles. They don't care what it is. They just, whatever they have in their truck, they replace. I was on a job site once. We were working on a clock, and I noticed this guy was nozzling up heads on the ball field on the inside of the track. And he had a little bucket with him, and I was noticing that he had the nozzle rack in his hand. It was a hunter nozzle rack with the 12 or 14 nozzles. And I was just kind of watching the guy, and he snaps off the first nozzle and he goes to the head and he plugs that nozzle in. Goes to the next head, he plugs another nozzle off the same rack. And then the third, same rack. So I walk up to the guy, hey, how you doing? What's up? Oh, I'm just nozzling these heads. I go, boy, you sure have a lot of nozzles here. He goes, yeah, I don't understand. Why do they give me so many nozzles? I mean, heck, one of these racks is good for like 14 heads. This guy didn't have a clue that every nozzle has a different precipitation rate. Every nozzle is supposed to be used in certain applications. Well, if, if you have a system like that and then you're trying to have anybody's system try to manage it, good luck. You know, the whole idea here is to put the water down evenly. And if you're not putting the water down evenly, there's only so much any kind of a smart controller is going to be able to do from that standpoint. Next. Uh, just a couple of case studies that talks about uh, water savings. This is a case study we did with uh, MidAmerica. And uh, we saved them 230% uh, of water, saved them uh, $60,000 over a year period, and 22 million gallons of water. Next. Uh, this is another uh, case study done at the Denver campus, and you can see on the left the uh, consumption in gallons and the dollars saved and used over here on the right-hand side. So, again, smart controllers have the capability because they are adjusting themselves on a daily basis. They have the ability to save a lot of labor and a lot of money. You can only afford to run around and reprogram your clocks by hand so often. And we'll run into people say, oh, I, do a, I do a great job reprogramming my clocks. You're not out there every day doing it. If you are, then you're wasting an awful lot of your time. You know, if you're in the maintenance business, you might be getting out there on a monthly basis, maybe every other week basis, and reprogramming your system. But because you're not out there every day, you're going to adjust them a little high because you have to safeguard yourself from having the system run when it gets hot. Because of that, you're simply going to have a tendency to put a little bit more water down than you need all the time. Systems like this, they're out there adjusting the systems every day. Every station, every valve is being adjusted both on the frequency and the runtime on a daily basis. Next. Hit it. Uh, smart controllers. Next. Set it and forget it. It is the answer to everything you ever wanted to use. No, not a chance. We have some people to go out there and say, yeah, you put smart clocks in and all your troubles go away and everything's perfect forever. That's not the case. Next. Let's look at some, some considerations and issues. Number one, electrical issues, shorts, open circuits. Well, if you didn't have a smart controller, you may not know you have problems. You know, we're working on a lot of Caltrans right now. We're running situations where we're putting our clock in today that monitors electrical issues where the clock that was there before didn't. Now they're getting all sorts of alarms saying, hey, you got shorts on these stations, you got open circuit stations aren't running. It's almost like information overload. Kind of out of sight, out of mind. So now that you're giving them the information, they're finding out a lot more about their systems than they knew about and may not even want to know about. Next, flow issues. The same thing goes on here. Most people today still use normally closed master valves. That means that during the day when the system is not running, the main line is not pressurized. So these guys are finding out when they have flow sensing that they have had valves that might have been stuck on for years. It's a valve that's you know half a mile down the freeway, running these tree wells and so on. 
And every time that main line gets pressurized because that valve is not working properly, it's running. And it's putting water out until the system gets done at 6 in the morning and then it shuts down. The guy goes out during the day, doesn't see any sprinklers running, everything looks fine and dandy, and he goes on down the road. The problem is you're not irrigating properly, you're messing up the flow for the entire system, you're wasting a lot of water, and when you're wasting a lot of water, you're going to be paying a lot more for that water. So flow is another one of these things that's going to show you information that you were not aware of before and you got to be aware that you're going to have to put a little more time and effort in up front to get your systems running 100 percent to be able to benefit from down the road. Next. Another issue and I'll blame our water agency person over here a little bit on this one. Uh, that's a fact that we run into these water window restrictions. So initially these systems were designed by a professional or maybe Javier did it back when he was an architect, I don't know. And they were designed to work within a certain time frame to be able to get all the irrigation down under peak usage. So that in the middle of the summer, when the ET is two and a quarter inches per week, and you have a 12 hour water window for six days out of the seven, there's enough time to get everything put down and keep your landscape green. That was great, that's how he designed it. Then it gets installed and time goes by and pretty soon they decide to put in reclaimed water and well you can't run it during the daylight hours. So you got to take that 12 hour water window and you got to shrink it down a little bit because we can't run the risk of having irrigation on the sidewalks or wetting people when they're walking their dogs. So you can't run from 6 to 6, you have to run from maybe 9 to 5. Okay, so you knock off a few hours every day. Oh, by the way, um, you know, we really don't want you watering on the weekends because we don't have the manpower around to be able to service equipment if it breaks. So our preference would be just keep the irrigation off on uh, Friday and Saturday nights so we don't have to worry about having a guy run out on the weekend and pay him time and a half to fix anything. Okay, so there went the six days down to five. And then our friends at the water department say, hey, we would like you to go ahead and change these heads out, change these, pre the, these uh, spray head nozzles out to these really cool new MP rotators and high efficiency nozzles that put down a lot less water. And all of a sudden, this station that used to take maybe 10 minutes to run now needs 30 minutes to run. And you multiply that times the amount of stations on the clock they're using it. And pretty soon, there's not enough hours in the day to, put, to get the irrigation down. So what happens is in the middle of the summer when there's a peak load on for the landscape, you run out of time. And your landscape will suffer because of that. These systems, because they know what you're doing, you know, again, they're oblivious. They're going to tell you, you need to put down 18 hours of water today. And you go, well, my system is not going to allow me to put 18 hours of water. Something's got to give. So in many of these cases, many of these systems will tell you, hey, you're on, you're, your water window, too short. It ain't going to happen. You physically, mathematically can't get it done. You have to be aware of that. Next. Set it and forget it? No, you can't set it and forget it because you're not dealing with plastic plants. You're dealing with a entity out there that is living and growing and changes all the time. I have a customer in Northern California. He goes through very wet winters. We don't know what that is down here, but he goes through very wet winters. When he comes out of the winter, his lawns, the roots have died back because it's been so wet. So when he comes out of the winter going into spring, he's got to change his systems to tell it that the roots are no longer six inches, they're two inches. If he leaves it at six, it's going to water too infrequently and his grass is even going to suffer more. So he's got to go in there and periodically make changes to accommodate the plant material as it is growing. If you're a newly landscaped, obviously you put in one gallon shrubs over a period of years, they're going to grow, their roots are going to get dip, uh, deeper, you're going to have to adjust for that. You might be overseeding every year, you might be out in the desert where they overseed every lawn area every year with perennial ryegrass. You've got to go into the system, you've got to tell the system that you've just overseeded so it can adjust around that and give you the kind of irrigation that you require for that. Next. Uh, manual watering. These systems do a great job putting down what is required. Where you can get messed up is you have guys out in the field that are still out there every day turning everything on. And that's going to, again, it's going to mess up your water usage. It's going to mess up what the system wants to put down. It's going to make your water bills look high. Fortunately, some of the systems today have the ability to separate the flow out by how much it was automatic irrigation, how much it was manual watering because the guy used his phone or he went to the clock, 
and how much of it was because guys were out there bleeding valves or using quick coupler. So you can get the tools there that will help you to kind of say, hey, I'm using 20% of my water manually. What's going on, guys? Leave them alone. Let the system do what it needs to do. Next. The other thing you'll run into is you're not going to see the same water savings every year. You know, I don't know how it worked with, with Javier this year, but we do a lot of try trial units we put out in the field. Well, units we put out this last winter, they're comparing this year's winter usage versus last year. Well, last year we did have a little bit of rain. This winter we didn't have any. So to compare the two, it's not an apples to apples comparison. They need to look at what the ET was in relationship to their water usage versus the ET and their water usage to get an apples to apples comparison. If you put in a smart system, probably you're going to get a huge saving the first year because the system's really putting down what it needs to put down. From that year forward, some of your customers are going to expect to see that same savings over the year before. It ain't going to happen. You know, if you save 40% this year, you're not going to save another 40 on top next year. The system is going to get to the point where it's putting down what is required to put down. They're going to hit you up on, why aren't you saving me more water? I'm putting down exactly what is required. The real question would be, if I didn't have this system, how much more would your water bill be this year? So you've got to make these people aware of these situations. Next. I call this the gorilla in the room. And this is the one issue we really dance around a lot because we don't want to insult the customers. Well, I won't insult anybody here because you're here. You do care. But there are a lot of people that don't. And as a manufacturer, again, we're trying to sell our product. The water agency people are trying to give away the rebates. But the problem is if the guy that we're speaking to doesn't give a rats, we're all kind of wasting our time. And I'm sure we've all run in situations where we have talked to either public agencies, no offense, or maintenance contractors, no offense, that just don't care. There are many maintenance contractors, it's not their water, it's not their water bill. Why should they care about putting the right amount down? If they allow me to use as much water as I want, I'm going to keep the landscape green, I'm going to just put a lot of water down. It's only when the maintenance contractor is held responsible at some level for the water allotment does he become interested. Or if there's so much competition out there and he's trying to find a way to separate himself from the competition, he will offer a water management package that the other guys won't do. Again, to kind of separate himself from the guys that are just mowing and cutting and whatever, I come in and I go, I'll do all the same thing these guys are doing. I'll trim, I'll cut, I'll mow, I'll blow, but I'm also going to guarantee you're never going to see irrigation in the rain. I'm going to guarantee we're going to reprogram every clock every day to the need. I'm going to be able to shut systems down remotely. I'm going to be able to offer all these things the other guys can offer. Isn't that important to you? So now he takes an interest in water conservation because it might get him jobs that he might not otherwise have gotten. On a public, public agency standpoint, we run into the same issue because we sometimes run into people, again, no offense. They got tenure. They've been doing their job for 20 years, 30 years. They don't want to make a change. They don't care about water savings to their consumer. I mean, I can only talk about it from experience. I've walked up to guys. We have put trial units in. We have showed water savings. And I stand there. I look at the guy. And I go, man, we can do this across your city. There are rebate dollars available from the water agencies. Look how much you can save both in labor and in water. And they look at me and they go, I don't care. And I go, what do you mean you don't care? I don't care. I got five years left. I'm kind of happy going around reprogramming my clocks every week. So again, that's tough. Well, you know, how do you get around those things? I don't know. Maybe over time those people retire out. We get new people to come in and have an interest, like you that are sitting in this room today. But we always call that the gorilla uh, in the room because that's the problem we all run into. And Daryl's moving around here. So as it says here, when the well's dry, we know the worth of water. And the problem with our industry is the fact that when the well gets dry, the first people that are going to get shut off is us. They're going to attack the landscape industry. You know, again, I'm nothing against our friends that make artificial grass, but it's going to be the lawns are going to go bye-bye. And guess what? You don't need to mow those lawns. You don't need to water those lawns. You're not going to sell sprinklers for them. You're not going to need to have labor out there maintaining them. You know, they're going to, you know, if you go to certain areas, again, there's a lot less maintenance that is required. I like landscape. I like plant material. That's, that's my background. I just think we do, need to do a better job of doing it. That's all. I think that's it. Thank you. Any questions? 
standing ovation is amazing. That's mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, why don't we take a five minute just to grab a cup of coffee or water, and we're going to flip computers over here, and then I will uh, introduce Kirsten here. Okay? Yeah, this is Richard Daigle and Mark Petticone with uh, Green Industry News. We're celebrating uh, Smart Month, and Mark had just made a presentation to a lot of our members. So, how'd you think it went, Mark? Uh, I thought it went very well. Uh, having Kristen here from the uh, Clear Results talking about the rebates program uh, really worked out well. I wish we'd have had more people here in attendance. I think the people that were here got a lot out of it, but there was an awful lot of empty seats too. So. It was a great event. We appreciate it. Next time you guys need to be here. Thank you.